Well, hello. Welcome to another edition of Crown Gridiron Nation. No Jim Mullen today. He's off doing presidential things. So I'm Darren Dupont sitting in the big chair. But you'll know these two familiar faces out on the West Coast. Gord Randall's with us again this week. And out East, Mike Hogan, who had a chance to, Mike, celebrate a good friend this weekend. Yeah, great cup morning. Uh, Chris Schultz, my longtime radio partner and, uh, and a couple of years doing Argo games on TSN Radio. Uh, was inducted into the media wing of the Canadian Football Hall of Fame. We're all wearing our buttons uh, tonight for the Schultz. So uh, congratulations, big man. Long overdue, but uh, thank you for bringing that up. He was uh, anybody who's a Canadian football fan knows all about the big man, and uh, and and he's really missed. It was a really nice morning. I would say loved in all corners of North America. Uh, so glad we could uh, squeeze that in here off the top. But lots to get to on another championship week. So let's get into the two-minute offense. Let's start with Cal, 27-15 over Stanford. Alec A.O. Manor from Medicine Hat, Alberta. Three receptions, 43 yards in the loss. Arizona got past Utah, 42-18. Tanner McLaughlin, four catches for 51 yards. From Lethbridge, Alberta in the win for Arizona. SMU over Memphis, 38-34. Jeffrey Canton, our coup for Memphis. Out of Levy, Quebec, four tackles and a pass knockdown in that one. And UNLV edged Air Force, 31-27. Jet Elad from Mississauga, two tackles and a pass knockdown. Guys, Malik Straker, the linebacker from Brampton, Ontario, with Arkansas State. Look, you guys talked about this last week. Wins matter when giving players recognition and taking them seriously. They struggled early, but now they're above 500. So how does this put his latest performance into perspective, Mike? Well, it doesn't hurt. I mean, when you lose your first two games and get blown out, what was the, what was the opener, like 75 nothing or something like that? If you're on the defense, you can pick up some really empty calories in terms of, uh, of tackles. And the good thing for him is, you know, through the first four games, when they were two and two after getting blown out in the first two, he had 37 tackles through four games and has kept that up. And last week, you know, they're six and two since those those opening two losses. He had what, a dozen tackles and a almost a 90 yard touchdown return on a pick six. He's putting up some really good numbers, and it's not just the numbers, Gord. He's he's all over the football field. Yeah, he's a really versatile player, and and you know, we might be guilty of, as you kind of alluded to, Mike, just sleeping on. Arkansas State and Malik Straker a little bit because of that slow start. But all of a sudden, I mean, not only are they winning games, they're bowl eligible at six and five. And and so we're now looking at an Arkansas State team that you're going to see in the postseason as well. You know, it's a pretty decent year, all told, and a really good bounce back given how bad the start was. And this past week, you know, we saw a little bit of everything from Straker flying over the all over the field, making tackles. He can slide down to the box and make plays there. He can drop back into the secondary and make plays in the passing game as well. Pick six you talked about as they just dunked on Texas State 77 31 the final in that game uh it, it's they've really come on strong and that's not necessarily surprising really the the start for Arkansas State was was more the outlier they've consistently been a a pretty good to very good mid-major team over the last decade or so and so that appeared to be the outlier it's nice to see them bounce back and and Straker maybe not the MVP of that defense but if not he's certainly on the short list for that Curtis Rourke, Oakville, Ontario, younger brother of Nathan Rourke. He has filed to play in the Hula Bowl, uh, the first bowl game now, or the first all-star game of the year. Will this be his best chance to sign a free agent contract, Gord, or can he actually get drafted into the NFL? I think the odds are really stacked against him to get drafted. Uh, and, and just to kind of give people some, some frame of reference here, in terms of the postseason you know, prep for the draft type bowl games, the showcase games, the Hula Bowl is kind of the third uh, uh, most prestigious of those behind the Senior Bowl and behind the East-West Shrine game. And and that's and to be clear, those are also games that are only for seniors coming out too, so that doesn't even factor in underclassmen. So you start to get down the list, you know, you look at some of the top quarterback prospects, Caleb Williams, underclassman, Drake May, underclassman. A lot of these guys coming out are not going to be seniors, won't even be eligible for this game. And then we're now looking at the third tier game. And the challenge for Curtis Rourke is that he hasn't excelled as a starter in a mid-major conference, right? And, and you know, I watched their game last week. I watched a good chunk of it. And he was actually quite good in that game. But you have to have stats that kind of blow people away. We saw, like, let's be, let's be very clear here. His brother's resume as a starter at Ohio was better than his is. And, and his brother didn't get drafted. So 
if Curtis does get drafted, it's for two reasons, in my opinion. It is that people know who his brother is now and that he has a taller frame and a more prototypical quarterback body than his brother did. But I don't think that's likely, but who knows? He could go down to the hula bowl, blow people away and get himself a shot. I do think he'll get a look in the NFL, but getting drafted, I think is probably a stretch for him at this point. I think I'd agree with Gord on that. And I think his best case scenario is, A, you go light it up at the hula bowl and you have some really good interviews. Um, and then I think you have to find a couple of teams who will look back to his film of a year ago and say there's something there. Uh, because he really hasn't been Curtis Rourke as, you know, he was, he's not as good as he was a year ago, at least statistically. So, you know, maybe you get a couple of teams who saw him play in the MAC a year ago, said there's something there. Maybe they look at the, the, the injury he took early this season and say maybe there's something lingering there. And hopefully for his sake, he gets a couple of teams who are interested in him as a UFA and he's able to make some money. Uh, going forward and find himself on a practice roster and then, you know, let the games begin and see if you can make a make a dress roster. I hope that happens for him. Uh, but right now, I, I don't see him being drafted based on the season that they've had and how the offense is, you know, kind of, you know, if you looked at it as being a passing offense early in the season, it's regressed to becoming a running offense. And it's been successful, but they're running ball, the ball more than they were earlier in the season. So I just it hasn't been a good year for him in terms of, uh, you know, lighting it up in his draft year. Just shy of 2,000 yards and only two games with multiple touchdown passes. So we'll see where Curtis falls in this. Okay, more on Canadians uh, south of the border. In, guys, you ready for this? The stateside five. Coming in at number five, Vancouver's Ty Benefield picked up two sacks in a Boise win over Utah State. In at number four, Nolan Ulm of Kelowna, B.C. Eight receptions, 81 yards as Northern Arizona beat Eastern Washington. Coming in at number three, Josh Baca of Ottawa, Ontario. Eight tackles and a knockdown for Kent State. They fell to Ball State. Number two is Curtis Rourke. 222 yards and a rushing touchdown in Ohio's win over Central Michigan. And coming in number one this week, Malik Straker. An 87-yard interception return for a touchdown. A-State all over Texas State, 77-31. Up next, the final Power 7 of the season. Welcome back to the program, and there are two left standing north of the border. So the question becomes, who rounds out the final five spots in this week's Power 7? Coming in at number seven in the Power 7, the Saskatchewan Huskies. Two-time defending Hardy Cup champ, fell to Alberta in the playoffs. Anton Amateur, young quarterback, will return next season. Number six, Laurier. And the nation's leading passer in Taylor Elgersma will be back, the third-year quarterback, leading a strong Laurier team into next season. Alberta comes in at number five. They say goodbye to graduates Quade Wolf Bowen and Jonathan Rosary, but they bring back a lot of weapons. Alberta is a program on the rise. Number four, Laval. Thomas Bolduc has another year of eligibility if he decides to return and challenge Montreal once again. Number three, the Western Mustangs. Three fifth-year players are gone. Evan Hillock will return. Western, they'll be right back next season. 
In at number two, the UBC Thunderbirds. Four passing touchdowns for Garrett Rooker in the Mitchell Bowl as they dismantled St. FX and are off to the Vanier Cup. And in at number one, the Montreal Caravan. Jonathan Seneca, 228 yards. He had 38 rushing yards to lead the team, and Philip Boyer went four for four, and their defense made a statement. Montreal is off to the Vanier Cup. So, Mike, when you're watching Western serve up all those turnovers in a lopsided loss to Montreal, what kind of flashbacks were you getting on the weekend? Sure. You come in for Mullen <laughs> and you start chirping. I never liked you. Um, but, yeah, it was it was reminiscent of, of the Eastern Final featuring another Montreal team coming up with a win. And, uh, you know, I, I think the one difference between, you know, the Argos game against the Owls and, and the game on Saturday with, with uh, Montreal and Western was that offensively, Montreal was able to take advantage of the field position and take advantage of the opportunities that the defense handed it. Um, the score in our game uh, a couple of weeks ago was, uh, what, 10 to 3 at halftime. This was 24 um, nothing. So while it was a close game in, in the CFL semi, it was not. And, you know, as good as Western's offense is, uh, that's a pretty tall order to go into a, a building where there are you know, 5,000 plus screaming fans and spot them 24 at halftime and try to come back uh, when uh, much of your game is predicated on running. Uh, that was a tall order. But uh, yeah, there was there was a real similarity there. Six turnovers in the first half is not good. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm going to use a bit of a snake metaphor here, whereas, whereas with the Argos and Alouettes, it was kind of like a viper, right? You're going to get these these catastrophic quick strikes that are going to be fatal to the, the opposition. That's what you saw the Alouettes with, you know, 100-plus yard house call. And I think there was a second pick six in that game as well. For Montreal last weekend against Western, it was much more of like a boa constrictor, where they it just it was like they were slowly squeezing the life out of Western all throughout that first half. They only score one touchdown off of those turnovers, but it was just it was just chipping away again and again and again. And for Western, the biggest challenge for them is that it forced them to get out of what they need to do on offense, which is run, 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 blow up play over the top. That's what they want to try to do on offense. And guys, what's interesting is that the two Western running backs both averaged over seven yards a carry in this game. But the challenge is that Western couldn't lean on them the way that they wanted to lean on them because of all the turnovers. I think you alluded to it, Gord. So, Seneca or the D, which was the star of the show for you in Montreal? Easily the defense. And and I, I still love Jonathan Seneca, but it was easily the defense. And what I found most impressive about it was that there wasn't any one star that really took this game over and was the standout for that defense. It truly was a collective effort. Guys, they had five sacks, three interceptions, three fumble recoveries. Not a single defender had more than one of any of those. And so, like, that, it truly was the whole cast of characters that came to play for Montreal and everybody contributed to it. And it was a sound beating on that side of the ball. It really was. You hold Western to three points the entire game. Even when they're in catch-up mode chasing points in the second half, they don't even get into the end zone. Really, really impressive stuff from the Montreal defense. UBC should very much be worried about that particular matchup coming up this weekend. Yeah, I'd concur because I thought Seneca was good, not great. I uh, threw a couple of picks and... But he, he didn't need to be great because what they were able to do was take advantage of that field position. And as you say, chip away, a couple of touchdowns, three field goals, a rouge. Um, they were able to take that field position and capitalize on it. And that's where the anaconda comes in because they, they kept squeezing points out of Western. I, I thought the defense was just phenomenal against a really good Western offense. But again, you know, the football is not round and it takes some funny bounces and if your team is on the long end of those bounces in a playoff game, you're probably going to lose. And, and that's what happened to Western. UBC, St. FX in the Mitchell Bowl out in Vancouver. Look, this popped up on my Twitter feed from Jim Mullen, who usually hosts this show, um, talking about the UBC inconsistencies. How much of that was UBC being inconsistent and how much of that was, you know, St. FX executing? I, I really like, especially in the second quarter, on that long touchdown drive that X had, I don't think their execution could have been any better. Um, you know, I'm, I was openly cheering for them. Sorry, Guard, as a UBC guy, but I, I wanted to see the conference succeed because we've been just squashing them on this show for, for years now. But it was perfect. It was short passes, a couple of runs, a couple of quarterback keepers and scrambles, and it was highly efficient. And if they were able to do that a little bit more, um, you know, who knows what would have happened. But 
I liked what I saw there, but how much of that was on the execution? How much of that was UBC's defense maybe having a little nap? And we've seen sleepy time for UBC in a lot of games this year. So um, I, I don't know. I just I, I, UBC is obviously a far superior team in terms of personnel. It took them a while to get going, uh, but uh, you know, I, I thought for 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 a while. I thought X really executed well, no pun intended. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I was in the building for this one, and and in the first half, like it, it truly felt like a, a, a competitive game. X really did come to play, uh, and it was clear that they didn't have the firepower that UBC had and that they were going to have to have a, st- a higher standard of execution in order to put points on the board. And there were a couple times where they did that. They also get the turnover, the fumble late in the first half that they turn into six, seven points, I guess, as well. Uh, and, you know, you go into the half and you're like, Oh boy, like we got ourselves a ball game here. And then UBC comes out of the half and they put 14 up quickly and it's pretty much curtains at that point in time. They score on offense and then they pretty much immediately score on a punt return afterwards. So it, it, full credit for UBC. They go into the halftime break, they adjust and they came out and put FX away early in that second half. But for a half of this game, it truly was a competitive game. Obviously X caught a break or two, that fumble being the biggest one of them, but and, and Kieran Flannery Fleck, by the way, missing a 29-yard field goal, which is super out of character for him. Um, but that's how underdogs often win upset games. So for UBC, it was good for them to turn that narrative around in the second half and make sure that didn't happen. But I, I, I think X has to be pretty satisfied with the effort on the whole. And taking a look around their players and coaching staff after that game, obviously disappointed to lose, but it didn't feel like the, the pall that you would often have over somebody losing at this point in the season. I think that given traveling across the entire country and putting up the effort they did, I think they felt like they were probably pretty satisfied in the bigger, grander scheme of things with the effort. Malcolm Bussey did return 10 carries for 49 yards in the game. Garrett Rooker, four touchdown passes for the UBC into the Vanier Cup. And that's where we go next. We'll look at the national championship when we return. Vanier Cup this weekend in Kingston, Ontario, Queen's University. We've got the Montreal Caravan and the UBC Thunderbirds. Montreal back in the big game, first time since 2019. UBC won it all back in 2015. Mike, that Montreal D, so good against Western, against this UBC offense led by Garrett Rooker. Yeah, and this, you know, for Rooker, I think this is a great opportunity for him to cement his legacy. We talked about him early in the season often when UBC was rolling it up about a guy who was certainly a co-favorite for the Crichton. And I I don't know how many votes he's gotten or received, as we'll find out, uh, you know, uh, before the game. But I just, I I, I look at him and say, okay, with all of the missteps that UBC has had this year, they, they certainly have not lived up to expectations because the expectations were so damn high. Uh, here's an opportunity for him to go and say, okay, there's a dominant defense on the other side. It's a championship game. It's on a neutral field. If I can go in there and put up 35, we're probably going to win this game. And he's got every opportunity to do it. Can he do it? That's a mighty tall order against a really good defense. But with the talent UBC has, it's a possibility. So I'm of all of the stuff that might happen in this game, Rooker versus, and it's not just Rooker, obviously, but Rooker versus the Montreal defense, to me, is the best subplot of this drama. Yeah, well, I feel like you kind of, without saying it, kind of segued to me nicely into my, probably my favorite matchup in this particular game, which is the UBC offensive line against the Montreal pass rush. Uh, Montreal has had a very effective pass rush all season long. Uh, I don't think anybody on the team has more than five sacks, so you don't have that one superstar to worry about shutting down, but you do have an effective 
front seven at getting after the passer and pressuring him. And so I think one of the biggest keys in this game is going to be how clean the UBC offensive line can keep Brooker because UBC is not a great offense when they are forced to do the quick game stuff and try and create yak yards and, and do stuff like that in the passing game. They are a much more efficient, effective, explosive offense when they push things vertically and Rooker has time to sit back there and use his arm strength, which might be the best in the country, to push the ball downfield. Uh, and so I think that, for me, is going to be one of the biggest keys in this game is can UBC give Garrett Rooker the time to push the ball downfield and into, into tight windows the way that he is capable of doing and very few other people are. And Gore, this might go back to kind of the, what you were talking about and what we were talking about off air a little bit is, is just how conservative UBC was at times against X. And, I, I, like, I want to see them light it up. Like, be, be true to yourself. Um one of the one of the best things about football, one of the worst things about football is sometimes coaches will try to coach to another team's weakness as opposed opposed to their team's strength. And, and UBC has the opportunity and the ability to light it up. That's that's what we've been waiting for all year, and we saw it early in the season. Uh, that's that's what I want to see. I want I want to see them go into into Richardson Stadium and try to put on an air show. It might not work. But how many games this year has Montreal seen a team repeatedly try to stretch the field against them? And they certainly have the, the, the talent and the ability to shut that down, but why not play to your strength as opposed to playing to your opponent's strength? Yeah, go, go down swinging, right? Um, but that also may lend itself to something that I think is a bit of an advantage for Montreal and something that UBC is going to have to be careful about is that this Montreal defense, very good at forcing turnovers. Uh, 24 combined forced fumbles and interceptions this season for the Montreal defense. That's more than two a game. They are very, very good at creating turnovers, and UBC is going to have to be careful with some of those ball hawks in the back end if that's going to be the game plan. Or they just have to be ready to live with the fact that they're probably going to turn the ball over a time or two, and they need to keep the pedal to the floor. I know that's my style of football anyway, so I would love to see that, but I do also feel like that's probably the best approach for UBC in this game. Yeah, Gord, you talked about the offense versus defensive lines. Really curious to see how those two all-star tackles, Theo Benedet and Gio Manu, who have garnered a ton of NFL interest, see how they stack up against this good Montreal D. On the flip side, maybe underrated, but could be just as fun to watch the Montreal offense against the UBC defense. Yeah, I agree. And and I one of the X factors, I know I said this going into the Western game, and in, to some extent it may have held to be true, but... Jonathan Senecal's legs, I think, are going to be a pretty big factor here. Um, and UBC has not, I was looking back at their schedule, UBC has not faced a quarterback with the type of mobility that Jonathan Senecal has all year long. Uh, the only guy that really did that in the Canada West was da Jackson Tachinski at Manitoba, and he missed their only game against UBC with injury. So this is going to be a new challenge for UBC, and in having a brief word with a couple of the members of the UBC staff, that's one of the things that they're going to be focused on quite a bit this week, is trying to find a way to shut down Senecal extending plays with his legs. Because let's not forget the fact that that doesn't necessarily just show up in rushing yards. It also can show up in big splash passing plays as you get into extended plays, scramble drill stuff. And Seneca is very good at that as well. So figuring out a way to contain him and turn him into a pocket passer, which he's still good at, but just not going to be as much of a weapon, I think is going to be one of the keys for UBC when Montreal has the ball. And, you know, you, you've kind of uh, led me in, in, into talking about Seneca and, and the fact that he is really good at running, uh, you know, scrambling, extending plays, but he can still get the ball downfield. And likewise with UBC, I would love to see them take some deep shots. They didn't have, they didn't have to against Western, right? So, uh, you know, show off the arm a little bit. And, you know, I, I, people, I think, are going to look at this game and say, okay, low 20s, mid 20s. I'd love to see a shootout. It's never going to happen, but I would love to see it. I even look forward to see what the what the weather forecast for Kingston is on the weekend. But uh, you know, it's 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 kind of getting into late November, so it doesn't really lend itself to uh, to a big offensive game. But if if the linebacking core, if the secondary is going to start cheating up to take a look at Senegal running a little bit, they have some great receivers in terms of the intermediate stuff. I'd love to see them. You know, just a sluggo or just a stop and go, just anything like that to try and stretch the field and make those intermediate routes open up a little bit more. So I, it, I really do want to see both teams air it out. It's never going to happen, but I just, it would be so unexpected 
certainly from the Montreal standpoint, I'd love them to see them take a deep shot every quarter. Yeah, we've talked a lot about the risk tolerance and maybe lack thereof from the Quebec teams over the years. But one thing that we have seen from them is that pushed into a situation where they have to open it up, they they are prepared to do so if they need to. So it would not necessarily surprise me, especially if UBC gets up early. It, Montreal loves to lead games and just put people away. If UBC gets up early, would not be surprising to me for Montreal to change things. And, and at that point in time, turnovers become a big piece of the puzzle again. We talked about how Senegal still managed to throw two interceptions last week. On the UBC defensive side, turnovers has not been a strength for them. They have been a good, solid defense in terms of yards and points allowed, but they have not been a great defense in terms of producing turnovers. Only nine turnovers on the season, and that was after four in one game against Manitoba's backup quarterback. So that, that's not a great number. And so for the UBC defense, I think that has to be a focus this week as well, is matching Montreal with those, with those splash plays, those catastrophic turnover plays. I would also love to see a lot of Shabbat from a Montreal perspective, um, you know, get him one-on-one. -on -one. He's not only fast, he's really quick. And, uh, you know, they also use him as short yardage guy, right? He'll come in at the one yard line and, and, and take it into the end zone. Did it last week against Western. He's done it earlier in the season as well. What a wrinkle if they were to run Wildcat on say a second and three, second and four, just to see how UBC reacts. And you still have Seneca on the field. Um, there are things that you can do later in that game if, if you show that that might just keep UBC thinking. But again, here's a guy who can run with the football. He can catch the football short. He can be a guy who can go downfield. I think if there's going to be a guy who's a bit of a, a, an X factor in this game for either team, I think offensively it's him. We can't leave this Vanier Cup preview without talking about special teams and what type of a factor you think they can play on the weekend, Mike? Um, you know, Gord mentioned the great kicking game that UBC has. That might be the biggest advantage either team has over the other in any category. Uh, UBC also had the big punt return last week for a touchdown. I can't see Montreal giving one up. I can't see UBC giving one up. So uh, if, if there's going to be an advantage, the punt game seems even the, the return game essentially is a wash as well. Uh, if it comes down to field goal, ad, 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 advantage UBC, but the rest of the game, I see it. Uh, I see it being fairly even. I, I don't see one team really having a big advantage over the other one, aside from in place kicking. Yeah, let's let's not uh, sleep on Montreal specialist Philippe Boyer. He's he's been very good this year as well. Not quite as good as Fleck in the field goal kicking, but probably better than Flannery Fleck. Excuse me in the punting game. So uh, he's he himself is a is a very good specialist as well. What I think is the real difference between the two teams, though, and you alluded to this, Mike, is the return game. Montreal in kick and punt returns this season, the longest return they've had all season long in either game has been 34 yards. UBC has done that four times or better. So that that is a pretty big difference in the explosiveness of the return game where Montreal maybe puts a little bit more pressure on the shoulders of their offense and defense to manage yardage than their special teams can can produce for them. So that that I think is going to be one of the bigger noticeable differences between these two teams. Prediction time. Who do you have, Gort, and by how much? Oh, I, this is a no-win situation for me because there are, there are people associated with this program who have been calling me a homer all year long. So this is really a no-win situation for me. I, I do like UBC's explosiveness. I think that the one of the big differences between these two teams is Montreal is going to be very, very sound and well coached, but I think UBC has a much larger potential for big explosive plays that swing the momentum. You know, we saw examples of that early in the second half against X last weekend. UBC has players all over the field, Isaiah Knight, Garrett Rooker, Sam Davenport, Shamar McBean, you name it, these guys can all go off at any moment. And, and so I think that that is something that really separates them from Montreal. I, I, would, I would predict something along the lines of like a 26 or 27 to 23 final in favor of UBC. It's really a difficult choice because do you take the team that's capable of the flash or do you take the steady and sure thing? And, you know, we've seen UBC play great. We've seen them play some iffy games. I'll be polite with that. Montreal just comes out every week and plays really well. So um, I, I think it's a safer bet to take Montreal. So I'll, I'll, I'll go with the Carabao on this one by mid-20s as well. Um, you know, kind of that 26-23 thing. That sounds good. All right. One for UBC, one for Montreal. No bulletin board material. I'm not breaking the tie. We'll leave it at that for this week. Games of the week coming up next.
It's our NCAA Games of the Week as we look ahead to the weekend. Gord, what do you have this week? Well, there's a host of Canadian players and teams that need to win to become bowl eligible this week. Syracuse, uh, Illinois, BYU all fall into that boat. Another one that I'm going to be watching, and frankly, most of you probably won't because it kicks off at 11 p.m. Eastern time, is going to be Colorado State at Hawaii. Now, if you're a football diehard and a weirdo like I am, you absolutely love late Saturday night games in Hawaii. Everybody else is done for the day. It's the only place still playing. For those of you that don't know, Hawaii is two hours behind the Pacific Coast and time zone, so they always start late. But this one's particularly interesting because it's Canadians on both sides that contribute to this too. And for Hawaii, their season is effectively over. This is just playing out the string. But for Colorado State, there's a lot on the line. They come in at five and six, so that sixth win, that magic number, will make them bowl eligible in Newark Yakuth has been a pretty good surprise for the Colorado State defense this year on a team that has been a surprise. If Colorado State becomes bowl eligible, it'll be their first bowl appearance since 2017. So this is gonna be pretty significant for the Rams as they make one of the most interesting, if not toughest trips in the country to go out to Hawaii and play. And good bring up Hawaii on a week where Dejon Allen is named the, uh, the offensive lineman of the year in the CFL, the former rainbow warrior offensive MVP twice, which is something else. Uh, I'm, I, you know, in honor of Chris Schultz, we talked about him early going into the uh, media wing of the Canadian Football Hall of Fame. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with his Arizona Wildcats. He, he was a proud alumnus of that program. So they've got the rivalry game against Arizona State and Arizona's really turned it on. They've won five in a row, four of those five against top 20 teams. The other one was against Gord's favorite team, Colorado, the, the, the media shy Buffaloes. Uh, so they put it together, and the, the, the game before that was a loss uh, against uh, USC in a game they would have, could have, should have won in a, in a real heartbreaker. They're playing excellent football right now, and part of that is Tanner McLaughlin, the tight end uh, from Alberta, who just, I think we can basically pen him in now for four catches and 50 yards every week. Um, with, with ASU struggling a little bit, they've really been on the roller coaster this year. I'd love to see McLaughlin get a touchdown this week because that's the one part of his resume that he really hasn't been able to pad this year. Great stuff, guys, and great stuff all week long. This weekend, just one game left, the Vanier Cup. So let's get out to the game.